Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, dear Lord, for all the tremendous blessings that you've given us in Christ. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And we are in chapter 12, the beginning of the chapter. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this followed by 40 commands. 40. Unless my uh, count is a little off, I counted 40 instructions so I can just point these uh, 40 out uh, to you folks and uh, just wish you the best of luck working it out. You know, uh, or I could offer you some formula that I've developed and refined over time that seems to work for me because this is just a whole lot of stuff to do and folks, we've never seen this before. In fact, uh, 40 commands uh, in 20 verses, that's uh, two commands per verse. Folks, that's a lot of stuff. Now, I don't know, you know, if you want to write all that down and put that in your pocket and carry it around. It's certainly not all the stuff that we need to do. It's, it doesn't uh, fully describe the enormity of... Uh, of all those characteristics that make up the life of Christ and maybe just maybe what I just said has some relevance to this topic to this subject I can do that I can just tell you look folks this this is a lot of stuff to do just you know do the best you can you know just keep whittling away at it until you know practice makes perfect right or, or, I can preach Christ. And, uh, and I can remind you that we are not under law, but grace. Yeah, I can remind you that the flesh profits nothing, and that unless we've died to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God that all righteousness is of the Lord, that our righteousness is, are as filthy rags, that it's now the righteousness that's based on faith, literally faith's righteousness, that Christ is the vine and we are the branches, that we are to abide in him in order to produce. Uh, for me to live is Christ, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. For the uh, fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, and on and on it goes. Look, people, we have two choices, law or grace. The, the law says that we must, through self-effort, strive to become holy and acceptable to God. That's how many people will read this passage. Grace, on the other hand, sees the text as saying, present our bodies unto God as those who have become holy and acceptable to God. Now, those are your two choices. One leads to bondage, guilt, slavery, frustration, failure, because it all has to do with law and self. The other leads to rest, joy, life, and peace, because it all has to do with Christ. 
This is the difference, folks. Here is our demarcation point. These commands rest upon a foundation of underlying truth. They're not floating upon the page by themselves. You know, truths such as we have died with Christ to sin, Satan, the world, death, the law, and especially to self. Christ paid for all our sins. We are eternally secure because of his perfect work. We are perfect in the inner man, and that new nature, according to John, in 1 John, cannot sin. And that new life in Christ is actually Christ living his life in and through us, and we are now and for eternity co-seated with Christ in heaven. What would you rather me do? Would you rather me go into a long, windy, one-hour sermon uh, telling you, you know, how that, I mean, look, folks, you can read, you can see all this stuff on the page. You can, I've, once again, I have counted these. There are 40. We can go through all 40, and I can tell you how I feel like, you know, is the best, what I think is the best way to go about accomplishing this uh, uh, in your own strength. I can do that. I can do that. That's, in fact, that's what many Bible teachers do. Or, I can direct your attention to one of the most important, vital aspects of truth, and that is that we are not under law, but we are under grace. And oh, Steve, then if that's the case, why are all these? Why is all this stuff listed here? Why are we told to do this and don't do this? Stop doing this. Start doing this. Why are we told that if we're not under under law, but we're under grace? And my answer to that is, is that we're looking at a lovely picture, a portrait of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we've seen many of these truths and more presented by Paul in the first 11 chapters of this epistle foundational doctrinal truth upon which all of the all of these instructions all of these 40 that we see in this chapter rest i count 40 commands we have not seen that at all up until now but you need to know at the outset right from the from the start that these commands reveal what must reflect or manifest the reality of Christ living inside a life as we abide in the vine, we the branch, as we abide in the many truths that, that have been presented us. The imperatives, the commands, the instructions of Scripture are not intended for the believer to try to accomplish the best that he can. It's something far greater, far grander than that, folks. They declare what must be evidenced outwardly as a sign of what is the inward reality of Christ living there. We can artificially try to duplicate what only the life of Christ can really accomplish. We can try to, to do all the instructions and the commands of Scripture through self-effort and still remain dead to righteousness. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We truly manifest the righteousness of Christ when he is allowed to live his life through us. But he's not going to compete with us. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2.20 Folks, we either understand that it is his life and righteousness that must be manifested through us, or we default and substitute our own synthetic righteousness in its place. Self-righteousness is the product that emanates from self-effort. There is no other option, either his righteousness or our unrighteousness. Foundational truth must be the bedrock of our lives. Nothing dare replace it. Our entire growth 
as a believer, rises and falls upon this element. Christ prayed that we would be sanctified, grow in truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 7. To say that God only blesses us when performance is accomplished in accordance to a standard law is not only wrong, it's proven wrong by what we've seen in the first 11 chapters of this epistle. The blessings, the grace that we have received before we even arrived at this point is tremendously overwhelming. Grace states that, that we are blessed apart from any merit whatsoever. And I want you to, folks to beware of current trends, to lump God's complex work in your life into some pat solution such as just do it. You know, just read it and do it. You know, I mean, that's a Nike slogan. And, you know, and here's how I think you ought to do it. This is how it works for me. There's been uh, numerous books, I don't know, countless numbers of books written with formulas and methods and, you know, and stuff and how to go about accomplishing the righteousness of God. All the while leaving out the source, which is Christ, the true source. All that that does, folks, is fill the place where truth ought to be and fill it with error. That is actually drives a wedge between our Savior and us. Until we are enabled to confidently rest in His truth that we possess the full righteousness of Christ, self-effort or condemnation will defy the growth process. When we become anxious over any part of our Christian life, we are in actuality claiming that God's perfect work is faulty. Self functions independent of God's will and timing. It'll rush ahead and try to produce these imperatives by means of natural human strength. Why? Because, well, we've just got to. But that is not how we come to realize these things in, in experience. Our text will go on to teach us that God has provided the needed measure of maturity according to the need of the believer and the body of Christ. God doesn't consider the new believer or, or any believer's maturity level the least bit inferior to the mature believer. Each Christian has his own position and responsibility regardless of his level of maturity. God utilizes each person at all levels of spiritual growth, but self is never content with God's level of progress. This rejection of God's maturity position can lead the believer into discontentment with the plan and purpose of God. We can rest in his reason for having us at the level of growth that he's granted us at any time. Stop, please, folks, stop and think about it for a moment. You've got one believer here. He's been a believer for 50 years. You've got a, a, a new babe in Christ, a new brand new convert and they're both sitting in, side by side in church with the preacher telling them they ought to do this and, and stop doing this. And, and so the one with the, the 50 years of experience and, and relationship of walking with the Lord as compared to the one who just came to know Christ yesterday, both of these are expected to, I don't know how to put this. Think about it. God expects the same out of both you got to be kidding. Each Christian has his own position and responsibility, regardless of his level of maturity, but they're different. And God utilizes each person at all levels of spiritual growth. But self's never content with God's level of progress. And this rejection of God's maturity position can lead the believer into discontentment with the plan and purpose of God. We can rest in his reason for having us at the level of growth that he's granted us at any particular time. And when one of us takes it upon ourselves to exhort another believer to straighten out you know, their life in, in some given area, what we risk is the probability of misleading that brother or sister 
away from the area of God's purposed work. We have to leave the direction of God's sanctifying work up to Him. We can't play God in people's lives. Resting in that area where God is working in our lives, it leaves us with the anxious expectation of these good and godly characteristics surfacing in our daily walk. You know, a strange thing, a really strange thing occurs in the life of the new Christian, the new believer in Christ. You know, precious little time passes from when, you know, he was on his knees declaring his total bankruptcy of righteousness, worth, and ability until he's storming the throne of heaven asking God what he can do for him. I mean, that's amazing. Just shortly before, he had nothing to offer God, and now he assumes that his nothingness is the fulfillment of God's need. The truth is that service is the life of Jesus flowing out of us to others. The truth is that these 40 commands in this chapter as well as all the rest in Scripture, are His life through us serving others rather than our lives serving others for Him. Our service has to come out of the new nature, not the old, whereby He performs the righteous service. All we can present anyone is the manifestation of the old, rotten, sinful self with all of its depraved intentions and methods, However, Christ has everything to offer and is fully competent. Yeah, he is. He's competent to accomplish it in true righteousness. Service springs forth from doctrinal truth, which is exactly why we haven't seen such a, a string of commands until now. Forty commands in 20 verses. That's two commands per verse. We're, we're now being bombarded with commands after being, it's almost like we're drowning in a sea of law here, after being told we're not under law. Stop and think about that for a moment. If they are not characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, then it makes no sense that they're here. Listen, folks, Jesus came to give us life, and life more abundantly. We've been introduced to that abundant life in the first 11 chapters. We've been blessed so much that we... We, we, can't, we can't hardly wrap our mind around it. Why? Why did God feel the need to, to say, this is all I've done for you. This is who you are. This is, this is how much I've blessed you. And now, and you're not under law, and, yet, and now he just, he kind of drops 40 commands, two perverse on us, in our lap, all of a sudden, boom, bam, you know, here they are. He wants us to stop and think about the doctrine that underlies all of these commands and imperatives. It, it's out of this abundance that our service is supplied with authenticity. Christ is our life, therefore he's our message. Ministry apart from his life is, is merely a ministry from and to self. Apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, says the text. But our adequacy is from God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 4, 7. The text calls this our reasonable service, our reasonable worship, our logical, the word is legizomai, logic, it's only logical. We worship God for who he is, for all that he's done in our life, for what he's doing in our lives right now, and for what he's doing through our lives and in for others. And worship and praise for his perfect finished work functions as a buffer to diminish the thoughts which claim that his perfect work is our own. It cancels out any thought of self-accomplishment. And folks, when lives are being changed right before your eyes by his ministry through you, the temptation to look towards yourself and attribute his success as though it were your own is tremendous. You know, self-pride is a horrid monster. 
and praise relegates that self to the cross where he belongs. Gratitude, appropriate for the grace that's, that he so fully and richly bestowed upon us. And truly, he's worthy of all that. What is it that underlies all of these many commands? The full work of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ, which is in reality, it's endless. But we've received many foundational truths in this epistle. Redeemed, reconciled, regenerated, uh, justified, forgiven, born again, accepted, sealed, cleansed, chosen, indwelt, sanctified, transformed, adopted, made a new creature in Christ, delivered, made, made a joint heir in Christ, co-seated with him in the heavenlies, hid with Christ in God, made a citizen of heaven, given eternal life, given the righteousness of Christ, granted great promises, made a conqueror, made to stand. We, he always causes us to triumph. Joined to the body of Christ, gifted, granted full assurance, made a son of God, given peace, given mercy, loved by God, given understanding, given you know wisdom, given free access to God. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. Folks, and if all we did, if all we did was praise him for all of that, that you wouldn't have time to do anything else. So many well-meaning books are, are written to help free a believer from law bondage by recommending, you know, certain steps to take, actions to accomplish, or attitudes to adopt. And what is so well disguised is the truth that those steps, those actions, those attitudes themselves are actually enslaving laws. So we try and we fail and we try and we fail and we become despondent and we, some of us even give up. Well, this just isn't working for me. I've tried that. It didn't work. And then Satan steps in with false guilt when there is no guilt. There's no true guilt for the believer in Christ. The presence of, of guilt indicates that punishment is, is yet required to atone for that sin, and justifiably so. Christ has already fully paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future, and no payment is left due. The old self, capable of nothing but sin, well, it seizes that opportunity to step in you know, proposing to use the law that made nobody righteous ever as a solution, you know, to rid the believer from the horrible experiences, the horrible gut-wrenching sensations of guilt and condemnation. The old self, it puts on a pseudo-righteous face on the outside, yet it only delivers greater condemnation upon the already struggling believer. This is all that the law can do, folks, is add greater condemnation. That was and is its only function. Self will not wait quietly for God's timing. It has to save face and pride through an attempt of vain personal effort. When sanctification is only through truth, and it's according to the sovereign choice of God, the Holy Spirit, as, as to which truths that he will open our understanding to. This ha cannot slip our attention, folks. I, I don't want to go any further until you folks understand this. Life is Jesus. Service is Jesus. Our ministry is Jesus. Our walk, our message is, is Jesus. He's, he's the true source of all life, of all righteousness. He, he's, he's not just some person that, well, just lived back down through history sometimes. And, I, you know, we, we often, all of us do, we often, you know, talk about and celebrate and praise the fact, you know, worship around the, the, the fact that he rose from the dead. But, folks, we don't really believe that. You know, he's living in us and he's alive. He's not some distant memory or some faded memory from the past. He's actually alive. Don't you think that he is capable of living his life in and through us as a living, 
person, God Almighty, incarnate, that came incarnate in human flesh, that, that he's alive within us, that he, that he lives his life in and through us, that it is not us. It's not us. Our relationship is not one of where we, that we are struggling and trying to achieve on our own that which only he can, he can produce. And, and we, we tend to just sort of leave him, you know, off to the side. Folks, that's not how it works. Our our focus, our affection are, is to be set on things above, not on things below. He has to work through us, or, or no spiritual work is ever accomplished. And self, you know, effort may initially look good on the outside, but it will ultimately burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. My prayer concerning you all is that through these studies, you have come to, to better identify who you are in Christ, your identity. You've come to recover your identity, your true identity, that you're not being told, that, that many of you have not been told. You've been not been told that, that you're, you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And on and on and on it goes. That's my prayer. But it, my prayer for you doesn't stop there. My prayer is, for you all is that you would you'd come to better identify the cause for failure and just how far so many have wandered from such a perfect beginning which advanced our departure from the living Christ where that where the, you've become exposed to the actual problem in your lives that's presently that at, at the present time even is is just keeping you in bondage to your old self and that what may appear to be holy and good is, in fact, oftentimes an instrument of death in our spiritual walk. Folks, to live by the law is spiritual adultery and death. In very simple terms, the cure for all of our problems and disillusionment can be summed up in two words. Jesus Christ. He's our personal Savior who desires a vital living encounter with you. The first essential element of the cure from legal bondage of sin and self is to allow him to fulfill his mandatory requirement to know. Apart from understanding the abject need to know, we're bound to flounder continually in a sea of, of unknowing despair. We need to know what this book says. The second element of the, of the cure is trusting, trusting him that his truth is effective, that his sovereignty covers all circumstances, that his goodness assures our best. That's foremost with him. What he desires most of us is that we trust him. He doesn't need your best efforts. He needs you to trust him. He, that's his greatest desire is that you would trust in him trusting him that his plan is perfect and right on schedule. He's not running behind everything. I mean, this is the consistent theme throughout all of Scripture, that we trust him in all things. And truth alone is what will dispel error. Not somebody telling you what you ought to do to be more holy and acceptable to God. And some of these provisions of which we desperately need to rest in were shown to us in the pre preceding chapters. His gift of righteousness in us, His sovereignty, His timing for all the events of our lives, His level of growth at any given time, His pace for the accomplishment of our sanctification. And resting in Him allows us full contentment and peace concerning this progress of our lives in Him during any given phase of growth. We can rest in Him and have that joy, peace, and just without interruption, regardless of what happens. Because we know that he's in control. We know that he loves us. We know that he's taking us someplace. He hasn't left us on our own to kind of flounder around, flop around, you know, on our own here. That peace and that joy, it permits us to fasten our eyes on him and not on our own impatient discontentment over our seemingly slow progress. 
I sincerely hope that, that by now something has begun to dawn in your understanding concerning the how, you know, how we, how, how we, we accomplish what we, we believe scripture demands of us. Can you somehow see, folks, that the how is, in, in actuality, nothing more than the traits that normally show up in a person's life who has his life? That these are not things to do to become normal in your Christian life. They are the Christian life, the life that is Christ. So your exposure to his truth, and by that I mean his word, not mine will furnish you joy, peace, and rest. Nothing I could ever say could ever, ever have any place for faith to rest, for faith to, to grasp onto. Truth is not this channel, folks. Truth is this book. Truth is the Word of God. Understand this, and with greater frequency, you'll start seeing the pages of Scripture that teach on law begin to just pop off the page at you. You'll not be able to avoid the reality that law has absolutely no place in the believer's life as a standard for personal effort in obtaining righteous accomplishments. Folks, that's not how it works. The Holy Spirit will increasingly lead you to be abhorrent of the slightest suggestion that you return to law. The safeguarding of, of your living relationship with Christ from, from whom comes that rest, joy, and peace will become as vital as protecting the earthly family that you love. And you'll ever increasingly view the attempts of others to place you under a law as what it really is, an, an assassination attempt on your spiritual life, which is Christ. We present ourselves unto God as who we are not what we hope to become, and by doing so, we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Take note of the fact that in the, at the beginning of this chapter, folks, we see the two words conform and transform. These two words are contrasted. The contrast between the two are, are like night and day. To be conformed to this age as opposed to being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Folks, the word conform is quite simply you being involved in that of which you're not. You're being conformed to a, a system to a, an attitude, to a mindset that has that doesn't have anything to do with you. It's not who you are. Whereas transformed, on the other hand, is having to do with who you are. It's really being involved in all of that that encompasses your identity in Christ and who you really are. That's what we're looking at. And we're looking at an, an enormous amount of text to go through or that we're told do this don't do that 40 I counted 40 you may count more that's 40 aside from the beginning you'll, you'll notice I circled you know the beginning that said that's not counted within the 40 that's the presenting ourselves not being conformed but being transformed and then followed by 40 and we're not under law I'm trying to get you to look at the profound difference between law and grace here folks of course he has to he has to list these 40 because if he didn't we wouldn't have the lovely portrait of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ look I love you all I truly do until next time thanks for watching